How are you? Welcome back to Dr. Dave on call. Uh, we've taken a few weeks off to enjoy some downtime towards the end of summer. Spent some time with our family and hope you all have had an enjoyable end to the summer as well. We are excited to get back to our fall programming on Dr. Dave on call and wanted to take a minute just to give a moment of thanks to our editors, uh, Abel and Sophia Sanchez. They are a, an amazing father and daughter duo, and they are doing a, an outstanding job editing the video podcast here. And most importantly, we are so grateful to all of our listeners and viewers who support the show during these last few months. It's been very busy during the COVID-19 pandemic. The level of engagement is just outstanding. So please keep on responding, downloading our episodes. And if you haven't had a chance, uh, take a visit to our website, Dr. Dave on call. Take a moment. You'll find our episodes, both the video, um, the video cast and the podcast too as well. And continue to download and support us. Uh, we're available on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts. So this fall, we have an exciting lineup of shows as well. I am thrilled to share with all of you that I am taking part in the COVID-19 vaccine trial. So it is called the COVE study. It's at the University of Illinois um, at Chicago Health System. They are testing the Moderna vaccine and I am just so honored and excited to be a part of this uh, pivotal trial. I actually received my first uh, injection about 10 days ago. So I'm going to be dedicating a few episodes uh, this fall to my experience in the trial. Should be having our first episode airing on this uh, specific uh, topic coming out here in the next week or so. So excited to share that for you as well. Going to be having some important guests to this fall. Um, we are going to be talking about the return to school um, and colleges and universities and how that looks as well too. So I think it's a great segue into our current episode today. We're going to be discussing how we create the safest environment for our children to return to school as well as successfully open our colleges and universities. How do we do that? Well, the short answer to that is we need mass testing, aggressive contact tracing, and rapid quarantining. All of this taken together, these three things, testing, tracing, isolating, uh, is going to be instrumental and pivotal on how we open our schools and how we keep them open. So at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, it is an enormously large institution. It has over 50,000 students, faculty, and staff that reside on a large campus down in Champaign-Urbana. And they have actually developed a mass testing program that's considered a model system for keeping colleges and universities open. At the backbone of this mass testing program is this COVID-19 saliva testing platform. This was developed by Dr. Martin Burke. He's a professor of chemistry at the University of Illinois. And he created this test with his colleague, Dr. Hergenrother. And this is a huge, huge game changer in the field of COVID-19 testing. And we are thrilled to speak to Dr. Burke today. So let's briefly introduce this uh, COVID-19 saliva testing platform at the University of Illinois and how they integrated it on campus there. So basically back in the spring of 2020, uh, the University of Illinois was shut down like all colleges and universities were. And they knew that if they were going to successfully open their institution in the fall semester, they needed to create a testing system that could be implemented um, by testing everybody on campus at least twice a week. And at the time, given the testing delays on these standard COVID-19 uh, nasal swabs, Dr. Burke and his team discovered that they could actually use the saliva sa samples of, of, of patients. Um, so basically, you're not using this standard nucleic acid extraction step. And you cut out all of these bottlenecks that were seen in COVID-19 um, standard testing systems. So for example, um, you know, when you're using the nasal swab tests, you have to have nasal swabs, right? Um, you have to have the, um, the tubes, you have to have the medium that collects the tubes, and then you have to send them off to, to various labs that have to have that infrastructure within the lab. So any of those um, you know, supply chain weaknesses can really cause a bottleneck. So what if you have what if you run out of swabs, right? 
and you drive up to your COVID-19 testing site and they have no swabs for you, how are you going to test patients for COVID-19? You can't. So at the U of I, they developed this COVID-19 saliva testing system where one, you use your saliva instead of the nasal swab. So if anybody has had the nasal swab done, as I have, it basically feels as though you are getting a nasal swab, you know, jammed into your brain. It's uncomfortable. It can make your eyes water, you sneeze, you gag. It's absolutely terrible. And to be honest, using the saliva sample is a lot better in the fact that what we're spreading, right, are respiratory droplets, which are, you know, contained in the saliva. So what better, um, you know, um, fluid to test than the saliva itself? Um, two, when they're doing these um, COVID-19 standard testing, they're using um, the RNA um, in, in these uh, in these tests. And so what's happening is that if you can skip this RNA isolation, it's a very expensive and it's a very slow step, you can actually speed up this process. So what they're doing at U of I is that they're actually heating this saliva sample that the students give or the faculty gives. They heat it at to 95 degrees for 30 minutes. And what it does, it actually inactivates the virus. And this is actually a critical step. So you imagine like all of these COVID-19 testing samples that you're using the nasal swabs and they're sending them back to labs well you know if you are positive you are exposing those lab workers so but by actually heating the saliva at the u of i they're actually inactivating the virus so what you're doing is you're actually protecting the worker it's it's amazing so these are the three big big key steps that the u of i have done so you're using saliva instead of the nasal swabs they're skipping the RNA isolation, which is an expensive and very slow step. And they're heating it uh, to 95 degrees for 30 minutes, and you're inactivating the virus. So you're protecting the workers. So these are the three critical steps that the U of I COVID-19 saliva testing system has, has created. And this is amazing. So how does this work logistically at U of I? Okay, so basically they have a bunch of tents all over campuses, and they've employed hundreds of workers, both from the community and the university. So they're really, you know, getting, um, you know, getting the people of the community involved too, and they're giving them jobs too as well. So you walk in into an open air tent all around campuses, and you go to your designated square. So the squares are six feet apart. You dribble your saliva into a tube. The tube's put on a rack. It's sealed. And then they actually physically drive it down to the lab. They like have all these golf carts that go down to the lab immediately. And the whole testing time, again, they heat the sample there, 95 degrees for 30 minutes. They inactivate the virus and then they test for COVID-19. And you get the results back in less than 24 hours. And how do they result the labs, the, the lab tests? Well, it actually just goes right to an app on your phone. And they've devised a system so that any student, faculty, et cetera, in order to get in any academic building or dorm or anything like that, you have to access your data on your phone to show that you're testing twice weekly and that you are negative. And if you don't get tested twice weekly, you essentially lose your academic status as a student. Um, so again, they're, they're, they're not only devising a new rapid testing that can be done and give you results in less than 24 hours, but they're streamlining it, how they get results on your phone. Um, if you're positive, so what happens then? Well, they have aggressive contact tracing and it happens through the university. They have like a team of 60 people and they reach out to these, um, you know, individuals who are testing positive and they also work with the public health authorities. But what's happening is that they're quarantining everybody immediately and this is really pivotal, right? So we talked about this testing, tracing, isolating, and doing it so quickly on such a large scale. This is how you're going to keep a college and universities and schools open. You get the results back to the individual so quickly that we can identify those who are testing positive fast. We get the results back to them. We work with contact tracing to see who they've potentially infected and we get all of those individuals quarantined very rapidly and this is how we're going to contain COVID-19. 
So with that introduction, we are excited. Let's get right into our interview with Dr. Martin Burke. We are excited to have him on the show today. Dr. Martin Burke is a professor of chemistry and the associate dean of research at the University of Illinois Carl College of Medicine. We are talking to him today and Dr. Dave on call because him and his colleague, Dr. Hergenrother, have created the iCOVID saliva test and it's already a game changer in the field of COVID-19 testing. So we are happy to have him on our show. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Burke. Great. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, we always like to have our guests um, introduce themselves to our viewers and listeners. Uh, please tell us just a little bit about yourself and how you became interested in your field of uh, biochemistry. Sure. Uh, so I grew up in Maryland, uh, about an hour northwest of Baltimore. Uh, I dreamt about being a baseball player, but that didn't work out. So I, uh, the doctor was the second thing on my list. So I was really grateful to have the chance to go to Johns Hopkins for undergrad, uh, uh, planned on becoming a physician and then discovered science and, and particular chemistry. I was conflicted. So I did one of those MD PhD things. Uh, this was uh, at, at Harvard in the HST program at MIT. Uh, I finished there in 2005. And uh, I kind of realized that I was a chemist. And uh, so I did, I did get an MD, but I don't practice medicine. Uh, I, uh, I do research uh, primarily for a living. And uh, my lab loves to think about making molecules. Uh, so we have a kind of Lego-like approach that we do that. Uh, we're hopeful that many, many people could make molecules beyond chemists. So we're trying to simplify the process. Uh, we also make molecules that replace missing proteins. We call them molecular prosthetics. So that's what I usually do uh, in my lab. Uh, and then back in April, obviously, with the pandemic uh, upon us, uh, my provost asked me to help lead a team to stand up testing capability on campus. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm the associate dean for research at Carl Illinois College of Medicine, which is a highly interdisciplinary, uh, very team uh, kind of centric approach to innovation and creating next generation physician innovators. So we had really, I think, set the stage for trying to tackle something like this in a very interdisciplinary way. And I teamed up with Paul Hergenrother and we all went all in on this. So, so now we're working very hard on COVID testing. So the iCOVID saliva test um, that you created with Dr. Hergenrother has recently given, you know, the EUA designation by the FDA. Why don't, can you tell us a little bit about the background on the iCOVID saliva test, how it was created and, and key differences that we're seeing with this test comparatively um, to other COVID-19 test platforms, such as, you know, the, the, the PCR nasal swab? Great. So yeah, so actually it was back in April that uh, you know we were challenged to try to help address this problem. I think a couple of things we realized very early. The first is you know testing is not a silver bullet, right? It, it has to be done in a in a way that's comprehensive, that's data driven, uh, and that it can be communicate the results very fast. So uh, we designed the program. We called it our Shield platform to emphasize that it was all about safety, you know, to empower the community. Uh, and we put on the front end we call it our target team, which tries to use frontier data science and epidemiology to understand who to test and how often to repeat it. Uh, and then we also teamed up with a uh, computer scientist and a uh, group developing apps uh, to create a direct to your phone communication that was HIPAA and very uh, privacy compliant so that we could communicate the results very quickly and hopefully get people safely isolated as fast as possible. The challenge in the middle was the test. And uh, we were, you know, the, the target team was telling us we're gonna have to test everybody twice a week in order to get the maximum efficacy. Uh, this is based on the viral kinetics and the likelihood that you'll be able to catch someone before they infect others. So twice a week for everyone, uh, which is now we have about 50,000 people on our campus. So that was 100,000 tests per week. Uh, and Paul and I ran the numbers with the nasal swab and we could never not find a way to make that work. Uh, we had some experience because we had helped Carl uh, Hospital stand up COVID testing uh, the month earlier, and they were using the nasal swab, and they were at 1,000 tests per day, and we were already running into supply chain issues and trying to deal with all the challenges. So they say uh, necessity is the driver of innovation. So we, we knew we were going to have to do something different. Uh, we got really excited about saliva as a potential alternative because not only would you get rid of the swab, but it's a lot better than having a swab stuck up your nose uh, to dribble into a tube. Uh, we can imagine people be willing to do it twice a week, uh, not get tired of it. Uh, and it's also the medium that matters, right? We spread COVID uh, through saliva, mostly through aerosols. And so this was a chance to know exactly, and actually in a quantitative way, how many viral copies per mil directly out of your saliva, right? Which could really help. Uh, there's also a great study back in April from the Yale group, uh, Nathan Group and Ann Wiley showing you could detect SARS-CoV-2 in saliva even more sensitively than the swab. So that was a very helpful paper actually for us. Uh, so uh, we went all in on this, kind of launched a Manhattan Project style effort, uh, you know, fantastic group of students and postdocs. And it was Paul's idea to say, could we skip the RNA isolation? So if you look even from saliva, there's still bottlenecks and there's a kit that you use to isolate the RNA, 
but it's very expensive, it's slow, and it's a big supply chain issue. And so Paul asked, could we just skip that part? And uh, the team went all in. Uh, we tested you know, thousands of different conditions and ultimately discovered that if you simply heat human saliva at 95 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes, you inactivate the virus, but you also probably break it open and it exposes its RNA and you can then directly test it in PCR. So we, we skip the swab, there's no viral transfer media and there's no RNA isolation. It's really directly from saliva uh, to PCR. And the one thing I'll mention is there's been others that have come out since actually, you know, we published our manuscript on archive in, in June. Uh, more recently, the Yale team came out with an alternative direct uh, saliva test, which has been awesome. We've been back and forth with them a lot throughout this whole process. Um, one key feature of ours is that you heat it first before you open it. And this actually sounds subtle, but it's really important because it gets deactivated prior to any processing. So it protects the workers and makes it much easier to run in a lab where you don't have to, to be dealing with active virus. So for doing it on scale, we think that's actually a really key feature. And we've seen that because now we're at routinely now more than 10,000 tests per day, which is, which is a lot of tests. And so I think the, the key features there are making it uh, really useful for scaling. So Dr. Burke, I, I want to focus again because I think this is a really critical part of your process here. So essentially, you're not using the nucleic acid extraction step, right? So you're, you're heating it, you're not using that. And basically, you're negating the need for these extraction kits, right? Correct. So and, you, you don't need a kit, you don't need the machine that does it, you go straight from the saliva to the PCR, which is amazing. So essentially, you're eliminating any sort of bottleneck supply shortages that could be seen in that pipeline. So I'd say we don't eliminate anything. There's always something. It's honestly, the supply chain thing is like whack-a-mole. It's like, as soon as you think you got it under control, uh, something will pop up. So we're not dealing with supply chains with swabs, viral transfer media, mm -hmm. or RNA isolation. Okay, we got rid of all of those. We do so, We have problems with like, for example, tips and tubes. And, you know, it's, a, it's an extraordinary time where there are supply chain challenges, but, you know, RNA isolation is not one of ours. So if we want to extrapolate this, you know, outward, you know, even outside the U of I campus, right? So how widely available do you anticipate iCOVID saliva testing to become in the near future? So could we have, you know, an open source protocol, right, where you're not relying on proprietary equipment and that we can have other labs, um, you know, throughout the United States using this sort of uh, technology that you've invented? Yeah, that is absolutely our goal. So we are a land grant institution. We are passionately dedicated to serving the public good. It's a really unique, very privileged situation to be in, right? We just get the chance, just try to do something important. So it's really awesome. And our, our uh, Chancellor, Robert Jones, has been fully supportive of this. And President Tim Colleen, uh, uh, President Colleen called this an Illinois moment in the making. So they said, let's make this as big as possible. And we really appreciate that kind of leadership and allowing us to dream big about what we could do with this. So we are actively working on trying to get this testing capability out to as many uh, people as possible. Uh, there's two entities that have been stood up to try to achieve that. Uh, one is called Shield Illinois. Uh, it's being uh, the goal, which is to pretty much provide testing capability to our entire state. Uh, seven or eight different labs we're working to try to build up in a population density map driven way. So you've got, you know, testing locations close to everyone. Uh, we're also creating a, a, a mobile lab. So a, a shield lab on a truck uh, that you could actually take anywhere. And then we have a, a place that has a high positivity rate. You could go in and, and spend two weeks really crushing the virus uh, spread and really getting it down. And then you can move it right to places that need it. So that's something I think is really exciting. Um, and then outside of Illinois, there's an entity now called Shield T3, uh, which is being led by Bill Jackson, who is the director of the Discovery Partners Institute. Uh, and this is to try to get it out to everywhere beyond Illinois. So we've had about 35 other universities have reached out, uh, several which are now already using our platform. Uh, but Bill has really helped to stand that up. Uh, there's a lot of interest from companies and K through 12 and other communities that you can imagine. Uh, and so we're working really hard to try to do that. There's been a large interest now at the national level for partnering to try to see if we can work together uh, with different members of the coronavirus task force and others to try to get this out as broadly as possible. And honestly, several other countries have reached out now to try to see if we can get it there as well. So we're, we're all in trying to figure out how we can help expand our testing capabilities as broadly as possible because we think it has a real chance to help make a difference. Again, it's not a silver bullet. This is a really hard problem. There's so many different factors here, but as part of the solution, we think it's got a real shot to make a difference. And, you know, based on what, what we've read too, is that um, from the Yale data too, you know, 94% agree with the nasal swab and also cost, right? So from, we're looking at maybe like $1.29 a sample, which could be you know, a fraction at the cost of what commercial swabs are costing too as well. 
So not only could we be testing at a, uh, a, a more efficient rate, right? But we're also hopefully reducing costs too. Yeah, absolutely. So our, our cost currently per test is closer to about 10 to $14. Okay. Uh, and that is also, as you mentioned, that's already way lower than the current system, but we think we can get it even lower, which, uh, which would be great. So one piece of the Yale test, which is really nice is they actually uh, have a, a, a cheaper PCR assay because they only use one, one RNA. We're using three at the same time. Uh, and because it's less, they, you know, you could get away with a lot cheaper if you go to one. So we're already looking at that. Uh, the other thing is by pooling, you can actually reduce the cost a lot too. So there's there's buttons that we can push to try to get the cost down even further. We're, we're actively working on trying to do that. I think it is going to be important to get the cost, like you said, down really low so that it becomes as scalable as possible. And there's also lots of opportunities there by partnering. So we have a great discussion with Thermo Fisher. You know, how can we work together to get this more available? And I think lots of people are stepping up to really try to make this, you know, we all feel like this is an urgent issue. We got to try to do everything we can to help. Absolutely. And especially as we, you know, go back to school in the fall, because I, I want to talk about uh, the campus at University of Illinois, because the test that you've developed is essentially the critical process in terms of testing students and faculty, tracing efficiently and isolating those who are um, either asymptomatic or even symptomatic at the beginning stages. Talk to us about it's a really progressive program that the University of Illinois system has incorporated uh, for your saliva test. So essentially you're allowing safe in-person learning this fall on campus. So can you tell us just a little bit about the program? You'd mentioned, you know, um, how the mobile devices are uh, integrated in this testing platform and how important they are. Tell us a bit about it um, and, and also the impact, you know, the sheer numbers on the COVID-19 prevalence before and after the implement implementation of the program. Sure. So first I'll tell you the really good news and then I'll tell you about our challenges. Okay. So over the summer we started testing. So in July, uh, we stood up the lab. We actually converted our veterinary diagnostic lab into a human COVID-19 testing. It was a cool story. I don't know if you heard back in February, there was a tiger at the Bronx zoo that had been diagnosed with COVID that happened here actually. So there was Lei Wang in our veterinary diagnostic lab. He created a tiger COVID test and then we were able to transform the lab into a human testing facility. Uh, Tim Fan led that transformation. So uh, we, we developed our own ability on campus to do it, and we started in July with a, a, under CLIA certification. We were able to start testing our community, uh, and it was, it was wild to watch. So we, we had about a 1.5% positivity rate in mid-July, and then we watched it come down to below 0.2%. That's when I was so excited that this had such potential uh, that it could work, and that was with all of our faculty, our staff, and our graduate students and postdocs. You know? So we really thought we were really, uh, in a sense, in a very strong position. Uh, we knew there was going to be challenges. We brought 50,000 undergrads back to our community uh, and we modeled for this and it predicted there was going to be several hundred new cases that were brought with them. If you just look at the prevalence rate around the country, you know, there's going to be hundreds of cases. So we knew that. And with our fast frequent testing, the modeling predicts we will bring that down. Okay. We'll get things back under control. Uh, we also understood these are young people and uh, as much as we'd like to think they're going to do everything perfect, that's not realistic. So we worked into our model a certain level of non-compliance. You know, students were going to go to parties when they shouldn't. They weren't going to wear masks when they were at the parties. They were going to make mistakes. Uh, and we still had a very robust uh, likelihood of bringing the numbers down. What we didn't realize, so most of the students did all those things. And unfortunately, a small minority of students chose to engage in activities that we did not expect. So hosting very large parties, even when they know they were positive going to a party when they are positive, intentionally avoiding our public health when they try to contact them and tell them they need to isolate, leaving isolation and engaging in activities that are unsafe when they know they're supposed to be. So we've learned very quickly. And because we had this twice per week testing, we saw it quickly and we saw the you know spikes happening. And I think that's a key part of the story is that because we have so much data on a daily basis, we could see it early. So we just implemented very strong restrictions on the undergraduate activities for the next two weeks, essential activities only, going to class, you know, food, things like this, uh, and, uh, you know, empowering them to allow us to understand when their colleagues aren't behaving. So there's actually an opportunity for them to become part of the solution. Uh, we're very hopeful this is going to get it under control and that we'll end up, because we acted early, we're going to be in a good spot. But I will be honest with you and tell you, the students have to do their part. This is, this is really critical. So, you know, I think we're learning as we go. We're happy to pivot and adjust as we go. And we're going to do everything we can to make sure it's a big success. But it does require the students to do their part. It's really important. So, Dr. Burke, uh, you know, we're talking about 
just an outstanding testing modality that can potentially have a, an environment where the prevalence is so low comparatively, let's say, to community spread, right? So could we potentially lateralize, let's say, the University of Illinois system if the prevalence is so low on campus, even though the outside environment, so let's say around, let's say, Champaign-Urbana, et cetera, the prevalence is creeping up, is it a possibility that we could actually continue in-person classes on campus if the prevalence is low due to aggressive testing, isolation, and tracing on campus there while our other community spread of COVID-19 is high? Yeah, actually, I would say we were very fortunate to be in a position where our community levels are quite low. So uh, we have a fantastic Champaign-Urbana Public Health District. They've been working tirelessly over the summer you know, in concert with us, it's been great teamwork. And so we actually are starting at very low levels in our community. And I gotta be honest, the, the numbers right now that are going up are on our campus with our undergraduates. And it's over 95% of the cases are all in the undergraduate population. And unfortunately, it's very easy to link that to, you know, events that have happened because we have all the data. We actually know all these things that are happening. So I would say right now, and, and luckily, and we've asked this question, we've seen no spread thus far from our undergraduates to the community. It's actually still very much uh, contained. Uh, the community hasn't seen an increase. So actually the, the problem right now is our students. Uh, and, and again, it's very early and we're just seeing it on a, on a very early time course. So as long as we can get that under control, we're hopeful the whole community can stay low uh, and keep it that way. And then, you know, obviously we, we don't consider, we consider ourselves part of the community, right? And so, you know, and we know the virus doesn't care about borders or boundaries, right? So we're very eyes wide open about this. So I think it's critical that we keep our numbers low and we be great partners to keep the numbers in the community low. I also say our local um, restaurants and bars and, and our mayors have been amazing. So they, they voluntarily shut down indoor seating for two to three weeks as our students came back to avoid super spreader events. I mean, it was incredibly generous and forward looking of them to do it. It's an investment in us staying open all semester so that they get obviously business into November and beyond. But it was a bold move on their part, and they've been great partners. Uh, now our students need to do their part. I think that's what it comes down to. And I would also qualify, Dr. Burke, I mean, the University of Illinois system and Champaign-Urbana are absolute models for how to do things right. And I, and I anticipate that other colleges and universities, but also, you know, cities and communities who have colleges and universities in their, in their towns and cities are looking... Uh, extremely closely at your data and how you're doing it, because quite frankly, if you see cases going up on your campus and 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 it not not going in the right direction, I think it could serve as a as a good model, right? If it's doing in a great direction too, as well. So we hope so, and that's you know we're very hopeful still. That that's where we're going to end up, uh, but we're also eyes wide open of how hard this is, right? I mean, the math is brutal. This virus, one person can infect fifty people in an in an evening, right? And so you can have a and are not the number of people that an individual transfers to the, the you know, you can have most people at 0.2 and then you can have a few people who do unfortunately make bad decisions and the whole thing can and really go up. So I think we're learning very important lessons about tr by trying to run this on such a large, you know, population and learning as we go, we're very hopeful the lessons we learn, you know, will actually allow others to get even, you know, further out in front of this. And we're going to share everything we can, right? That's why we appreciate the chance to tell the story. And we just want to do everything we can to try to help, you know, any, everybody who wants to achieve the same thing to do it. So. Uh, Dr. Burke, you know, as we are getting into the fall, we obviously are concerned that, you know, people are going to be more indoors. Uh, we're not going to have as much ventilation. It's hard to open your window when, when it's 20 degrees outside. Um, and so we're a little concerned that, you know, our numbers could could actually worsen, even though we're at, let's say, you know, as of, you know, September, early September, we're at about 40 K, 40,000 cases a day. Um, you know, colleges are, are, are learning from you. I, 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 we recently saw at Illinois State University uh, has adopted a, a testing platform and incorporated the iCOVID testing in in its system, too, as well. Where do you see us, uh, you know, in the next, let's say, two, three months from now in relationship to, you know, your saliva tests and how we can, um, you know, expand testing on such a rapid scale and, and large scale. Sure. So I, I hope 
that it can become part of the solution uh, in many, many different places. You know, it's really, it's actually quite easy to set up the, the testing capability. It's, it's a very simple procedure. Uh, the other really important thing is that it's just standard PCR equipment. So there's a lot of labs, you know, all over the country that already have the back end in place. It's just a different front end, right, that we have found is one that's highly commensurate with the scalable testing that, that's going to, I think, be required. So, yeah, we think there's a lot of opportunity for others to adopt the uh, the test. Uh, and I hope it's been clear, like, we're, we're trying to do everything we can to help them achieve that. Um, and our hope would be, again, like, if we can be a model for how to make it work, that it's not just really the test. It's really the, the platform, the, the approach, the strategy, the comprehensive nature. Uh, and we're going to, you know, continue to try to improve our system as we go so that hopefully it'll be easier for others to not have to relearn those lessons when they, when they apply it themselves. Dr. Martin Burke, he is uh, the professor of chemistry, and him and Dr. Hergenrother have invented the saliva testing at the University of Illinois, which is a game changer in the COVID-19 testing here in central Illinois, but uh, hopefully uh, throughout the state of Illinois and, and throughout the United States too as well. Dr. Burke, we really appreciate you coming on Dr. Dave on call. Uh, we thank you for all of your efforts during the pandemic, and, and we are sure to hear more from you and the University of Illinois. So thank you so much. All right. Thanks so much for having me on. Thanks, thanks Dr. Dave. Burke. Take That's care. Good. We really appreciate this tremendous interview uh, with Dr. Martin Burke. Uh, who's a professor of chemistry at the University of Illinois. He created, uh, with his colleague, Dr. Hergenrother, uh, a game changer uh, uh, in the field of COVID-19 testing, the saliva testing. We are appreciative to learn more about the mass testing effort that is going on at the University of Illinois. They have really streamlined uh, a, a wonderful program um, to keep their college and university open. And how are they doing that? Again, they are using the saliva testing, the COVID-19 saliva testing that they created at the university. And what they're doing is it requiring students to come in twice a week to get tested. And they are using these outdoor tents and getting these test results back to them using their saliva within 24 hours on the app on their phone. And in order to get into any university um, building, you got to show that you're getting tested and that you're negative. And if you are positive, they are um, using a team of, uh, of 60 people at the university and working with public uh, health authorities to contact trace aggressively, seeing who's positive, who they've been around that could have been potentially infected. And they are quarantining them and getting that taken care of quick and expeditiously. And that's how they're going to, um, you know, get, the, the prevalence on campus low. And sure, yeah, they've had um, some issues where, um, you know, potentially situations that they haven't modeled for, as Dr. Burke explained, um, uh, and people engaging in risky behaviors. And that's why they've had these spikes on campuses. But they're learning to deal with that and making sure that the students have accountability towards this. So appreciative to Dr. Burke describing, uh, you know, the COVID-19 saliva testing platform. It is a game changer. Many universities, governments, um, and states have reached out to him and um, and his team down at the University of Illinois. And um, we're looking to, to see that in the coming months, other rapid testings uh, platform are going to be available too. So we're excited to see the evolution of this and, and, and to see that the, the proof is in the pudding, that when you have a college and university of the University of Illinois that large, um, who has done a mass testing program successfully and kept students in um, in in school, which is so important. Um, it's, it'll be a model testing platform for other um, areas, not only here in the United States but also around the world too. So we're we're excited to have Dr. Martin Burke on the show. Uh, we really appreciate his time. Also, thank you for tuning in today too to Dr. Dave on call. I encourage you to keep downloading um, our podcast and, uh, from Apple and Spotify. And if you're watching on our YouTube channel too, um, give us a like and subscribe to us too as well. Again, we have an exciting fall lineup to you as well and can't wait to, um, to bring you all new episodes uh, during this fall season. Encourage all of you to participate. You can tweet us or, or send us, shoot us an email too if you have any questions or concerns. And we look forward to, to seeing you this fall. Take care and stay safe and healthy, everybody.